Dear God, if I have anything worth saying, please open their ears to hear. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A baby's cry pierces the night. The cries of labor pain turn to the sobs of recognition as the new parents realize that this child is in danger. One of the innumerable complications of childbirth has happened, and this child isn't going to make it. And as the tiny, tiny light begins to fade, there's a terror that grips the parent's heart. It's a cold, icy fear at the bottom of our heart. And these parents have a choice. They can rush this child to the doctor, or they can rush the child to a priest. Now, a long time ago, there was a conviction that if a baby wasn't baptized, that baby could not get into heaven. There was an understanding, especially in a world where there was a really high infant mortality rate, lots of babies died in childbirth. There was this fear and so there's lots of stories of priests galloping on a horseback to someone's house in the middle of the night, desperately trying to get there in time, just in case. There's a story out of St. Petersburg, Russia, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, where there was a, a small child who was injured. He was two months old, and he had a head injury. And the parents chose to take him to the church instead of the doctor. And the two-month-old baby died before the priest had him in his arms. So what happened to that child? It's, it's funny to think about how people used to think about these things a long time ago. It's funny to think about old traditions and different arguments from a long time ago. But this story with the child, this two-month-old baby who died, that head injury was from a car crash in 2013. Still today, we are asking the question, what happens to that child? And that story was the parents were being brought up on charges of child neglect for going to the church first. What happened to that child? What about stillborn children? What about aborted children? What happens to those children if they're not baptized? Now, the Catholic Catechism has a really great answer. I know Catholics, whatever. They have this answer figured out, and I like it. And it says the church can hope. The, the church can trust in the mercy of God. And that gives us a reason for hope. We can trust in the mercy of God. When we don't know what happens to those children, when we don't know what happens, we can trust in the one who does. I don't know what God does with those children. I don't. That I can't point to anything as 100% proof. But you know what? I trust him. I trust God's judgment. I think he's going to make the right call. Now today is week four of our six-part sermon series about the life of Jesus. Today we're talking about sacraments. Now in the Methodist Church, sacraments is just a big fancy word for baptism and communion. We look at the life of Jesus, and Jesus did a lot of stuff. Sometimes he did miracles which we talked about last week. And sometimes he just sat down and had dinner with his friends. We talked about that at the beginning of the sermon series. And sometimes Jesus did something that was so inspiring, so amazing, that the church took it and made a tradition out of it to help us grow closer to God. Jesus did stuff that we take as an example of what we are supposed to do. The actions of God, sacraments, baptism, and communion. Now the first scripture lesson is the baptism of Jesus. And so Jesus comes to John to get baptized. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. And this is the only moment in the entire Bible where all three pieces of God are mentioned. They're in the same place at the same time. When Jesus comes up out of the water, it says the Holy Spirit like a dove descends upon him. And then a voice of God comes out of the heavens saying, this is my son 
whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This is the start of Jesus' ministry. This is the start of his road to the cross. And then at the end of the story, in Mark 14, we have the Last Supper. Now a lot of us have heard that story before. We know what it looks like. Jesus has dinner with his disciples. And then after dinner, he takes the bread, and he takes the cup and says, I'm going to give myself up for you. That's what he tells his friends. Communion is all about remembering what Jesus did for us with, with a hope for a better future. Communion is about remembering and honoring the life that Jesus lived and the death that Jesus died. Remembering and honoring the forgiveness of God. So that's communion. But what is baptism all about? What does baptism mean? Short answer, the, way, the thing we like to say, is baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. It's something we do on the outside that represents what happens on the inside. We say that baptism is God washing our sins away. And we use the water for the imagery. God is washing our sins, taking all the garbage in our life, the mistakes we've made, the times we've hurt people, the things we need forgiveness for. And he says, you know what, I'm going to wash it clean. And it can be really beautiful, but it leads to a really tricky question. If baptism is about washing away sin, why did Jesus get baptized? Jesus is perfect. Remember, Jesus is our perfect sacrifice, totally blameless, no sin. So why would he get baptized? Even John the Baptist, when Jesus walks up, John the Baptist is like, nah, you got this all wrong. I'm not supposed to baptize you. You're supposed to baptize me, right? Maybe baptism is about something deeper. Maybe there's more to it. See, Jesus had this habit of breaking the mold, taking all our worldly expectations and just throwing them out the window. And for Jesus, baptism was about something more. The questions we ask at baptism, there are six questions that are in the beginning of the hymnal, six questions we ask at baptism. Only two of them have anything to do with sin. The rest of the questions are about the rest of your life. Baptism is a commitment for the rest of your life. It's not just about scrubbing the dirt off, making sure you get all the sin off your nice clean clothes. It's about promising to live the rest of your life rejecting that sin, living your life getting rid of that sin. When you baptize a child, you can't just baptize a child. You have to have a parent or a sponsor or somebody there who's going to say, I promise to raise this kid to know God, to reject evil, to be a force for good. That's how it works. We have the promise. There's a commitment for the rest of your life. Baptism is joining a new community, joining a new family. Now, there's, there's a call there. Baptism is the start of a brand new life. We enter this new community, and this new community is supposed to be different than the life we used to live. For example, there's a reason you don't have an AA meeting in a brewery. Right? You're moving into a new life. <laughs> I got a call this past week from a woman. She was trying to get her son out of trouble. He was living in a world, he was, he was struggling with drugs, and he was having a really hard time getting out of this cycle. And so she wanted help. She, she was asking for some financial help to bring him home. He was living out in California, and he was in a really bad community, surrounded by people that were dragging him down. And she wanted to pull him out of that community, bring him home, wrap him in love, and give him a second chance to start over. He couldn't do that where he was, so she wanted to give him a chance to come home. And I said, all right, we'll buy the bus ticket. If, if you're wondering, that's where our second mile stuff goes. If you ever want to know what I'm spending that money on, just come ask. I keep a record of everything I've ever done for someone else who comes to me and asks for money. So he was struggling. And, it, and I said, okay, we'll buy this bus ticket. And I couldn't help but have the, the words of our baptism vow echoing in my ears. One of the questions we ask is, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and include this child in your care? And then our response, you know, we have this like printed on the screen response. And it says, with God's help, we will so order our lives. We will so order our lives to surround this person with a community of love, and forgiveness. I think that's all baptism is right there. Surrounding someone with a community of love and forgiveness. We have a responsibility as Christians 
to create a safe space, a space where people, where the broken can heal. I think people are terrified to be broken in church because they're afraid if they expose the fact that they messed up, people will judge them, people will pounce all over them. But that's the opposite of what we're going for here. We need to be a place where people can heal, surround people with a community of love and forgiveness. We say the problem, I love the words of the baptism vows. I do, I really like them. But the problem with putting them on the screen and then all of us saying them every single time, we kind of become robots and we stop thinking about what it is we're saying. If you just take a second to read through it and actually think about it, it can be really powerful. By being baptized, Jesus taught us that baptism is so much more than just being washed clean. Now, don't get me wrong. Baptism is about getting washed clean. He takes our sin, all the garbage in our life, and he washes it away. That, that is a huge part of it. But don't stop there. Take a step into the new life. Create a community of love and forgiveness. Join this new family. Now, I use the word family, and I do it on purpose. It's a very intentional word because family can drive you nuts. Now, I've said that before, and I kind of say it a lot, so I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I love my family. <laughs> and, and I'm not just talking about my wife. I love my wife. But like my brothers and sisters, they have a great relationship with my family. I don't want you to think it's terrible. But every now and then, family will drive you up the wall. They'll, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but what baptism is about, what communion is really about, is that love endures. Love endures. Sooner or later, oh, I skipped a whole bunch. Oh, so I'm reading the Last Supper story this past week, just getting ready for this Sunday sermon. I'm reading this story, and this one thing kept jumping out at me, and I just I wanted to share it with you today. This is the last time Jesus gets to sit down and have a meal with his disciples, the last chance for a chat. And he's being a real bummer about it. He is really <laughs> focusing on the negative. It's a very, like, kind of harsh, mellow conversation. Now, if you look in Mark 14, the communion bit is verse 22 to 26. But then right before that, in verse 18, it says, while they were reclining at the table eating, he says, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one of you who is eating with me. <laughs> one of you will betray me. What do you do when you're sitting down having dinner with your buddy? And he says, by the way, you're going to betray me. Okay, I thought it was okay if I had a second roll, but sorry. It's a real mood killer, and the disciples are so saddened. They don't know what to do. And so each one, of, one by one, they go up to Jesus, and they're like, you don't mean me, right? And then we get to verse 20. And verse 20 is just heartbreaking. Now, I'm in the NIV. I'm sure the revised version is just a little bit different. But it says, it is one of the twelve, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. You can't get more intimate than that. This is someone who is double dipping in the bowl with Jesus. Now you all know the rules. If you go to a party or a gathering and there's chips and salsa, you, you take the chip and you're allowed to dip it in the salsa. But then you finish that chip. You don't take a bite and put the chip back in the salsa. That's like licking the salsa bowl. That's gross. Right? You don't double dip the chip unless you're very close with those people. Right? Maybe if it's just family or if it's a real intimate gathering and you know everyone really well, maybe you'll be allowed to double dip. Right? Maybe. No, no, still some people are like, no, that's never okay. <laughs> All right. Well, sometimes people think it's okay if you're really close. That's how close this person is with Jesus. They're double dipping in the bowl. It was probably more like pita and hummus, but you get the idea, right? They're double dipping in the same bowl. That's how close they are. That's how much it must have hurt. And then immediately after the communion verses, uh, communion is verse 22 to 26, and then verse 27 says, you will all fall away. Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, immediately, Peter denies it. He says, no, I won't. I'm not going to leave. I will not fall away. And then everyone denies it. But, I mean, we all know what happens. 
in just a few hours, everyone abandons Jesus. When the soldiers come and take him away, he loses every friend he's got. I wonder, I wonder if the disciples protesting made Jesus feel better or worse. Jesus, no, I would never leave you. I will never deny you. They're, they're trying really hard. They're being sweet. You know, they're trying to be good guys. But Jesus knows. He knows what's coming. That had to hurt. One of you will betray me. All of you will abandon me. And then right in the middle of all this really negative, heavy stuff is communion. Right in the middle of all this very, very unfortunate stuff, Jesus gives himself up for his disciples. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. I am giving myself up. Let's make a promise. Let's make a covenant, a pact. I will always love you. Right in the middle of all that bad stuff, that's where that promise is. And I think there's a lesson there. It's, it's a little bit hidden, but if you look a little harder, you can see it. Forgiveness in the face of sin. Forgiveness when the sin is so obvious. We have to recognize that in this family we call Christianity, this family we call the church, we're gonna hurt each other. We're gonna make mistakes. Now it's not a good thing, but it does happen, right? Just like the disciples, each and every one of us is gonna fail God and fail each other at some point. And in those moments, what we need to do is forgive. Jesus forgave the disciples when the proof of their sin was staring him right in the face. He doesn't ignore their sin. He knows it's there, but he overcomes their sin with love. Forgiveness is easy when it doesn't hurt. When it doesn't really matter. Forgiveness is easy. Oh, sweetheart, no big deal. That's fine. Go ahead and get mud on the carpet. I don't care that much anyways. Right? It's easy when we don't care. But when it matters, when we care, it hurts. And it is so much harder to forgive, it's not even fun. And I think probably most of us in this room have something with someone that we are still hanging on to. Someone we're not willing to forgive. They've hurt us so much. We're just, we're hanging on to that. You don't even want to think about the person because it puts you in a bad mood. You don't want to be in the same room as that person because it's, you know, that family feeling. The more someone hurts us, the more important forgiveness becomes. The more someone hurts us, the more important forgiveness becomes. But Pastor JJ, you don't know my pain. You don't know my situation. You don't understand how much they hurt me. You don't get it. They're not even sorry. You're right. I don't know. I don't know the depth of your pain. I don't know who has hurt you and how much it hurts. I don't know your situation. But he does. Remember what Jesus did. Jesus forgave his disciples. They didn't say sorry. In fact, they denied that they were going to do it. They denied it. They didn't say sorry, but Jesus forgave them while staring right in the face of betrayal and abandonment. Jesus forgave. And so must we. Love endures. That's what family is all about. Now, baptism and communion, they're beautiful. they can be beautiful moments in the life of the church, you know? And we know what it looks like, right? The water the bread, the grape juice. We know what it looks like on the surface. But if we look a little harder, there's a deeper meaning. There's a hidden message. If we look a little harder, we can see the message of family, commitment, remembering, and forgiveness. It's the actions of God given to us to bring us closer to God and bring us closer to each other. It's the actions of God given to us to bring us closer to God and closer to each other.